Hello, my name is Martin Kuchera, and in this video, I'm going to present the paper Minimum Eccentricity Shortest Path Problem with Respect to Structural Parameters. This is joint research with Andre Suhi conducted at the Faculty of Information Technology at Czech Technical University in Prague. Let's start with some basic intuition. So here we see a graph, and let's say that the vertices represent cities, and we would like to build a highway between some of the cities. We can only build along the edges that are in the graph. So if there's an edge missing between some two vertices, it might mean that there's some natural obstacle, like a mountain that is really high between the cities. So we just uh, cannot really build there. We want to build a highway, and we would like the highway to be a shortest path. Other than that, we don't really know like which cities it should connect, uh, but we would ideally like the highway to be in some sense useful to as many cities as possible. So now let's have a look at some uh, possible highways that we might build. So if we could, for example, uh, choose this, well, it's the shortest path, connect some vertices. It is a possible highway that we might build. Another option would be this one. And well, there's many other options, but for now, let's talk about this one. and. Let's think about whether this would be a good option for a highway or not. And I claim that this isn't one of the greatest options. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of cities that lie on the highway, and for them, the highway is really useful. Like they can use it all the time, right? Then there's also a bunch of cities that are a distance one from the highway, and for them, it's also pretty nice. But then there is, for example, this blue vertex on the top, and for this one, the highway is at distance three, and that's super far away. That's like almost half the diameter of the graph. So, you know, for the people living in the city, the highway is close to useless. And that's why it's not a good choice. So the interesting question here is uh, like, what would be the best that we could hope for? What is the, what is the best highway that we can build in the sense that it will minimize the distance from the cities? to the highway. And in this particular graph, the best that we can do is this, right? So now we see that every city in the graph is a distance at most one from the highway. We say that the highway is the shortest path with eccentricity one. And that's the goal that to find such a highway. That's exactly the minimum eccentricity shortest path problem. So now let's define it a bit more formally. So first of all, I would like to say that throughout this talk and also throughout the paper, we only talk about simple and connected graphs. And now we can go to the definitions. So eccentricity is usually only defined as a property of a single vertex and is defined as the maximum distance from this vertex to any other vertex in the graph. So for example, in this graph that we see in the slides, um, the, the eccentricity of the red vertex is three because the distance to these blue vertices on the sides is exactly three. Now, in order to define eccentricity of a path, uh, we first need to define the distance between one vertex and a set of vertices. And this is defined as the minimum of the distances between this individual vertex and all the vertices in the set. So for example, the distance between this blue vertex and the set of red vertices is two because we need at least like two steps to get from the vertex to something, some of the red vertices. Now, the eccentricity of a set of vertices is the maximum distance from any vertex in the graph to this set. So in the example graph that we see, the eccentricity of the red vertices is two because that's the distance from all of the blue vertices. And then, eccentricity of a path is simply the eccentricity of the set of vertices that lie on the path. So again, this red path on the picture has eccentricity two. Now we are ready to define the minimum eccentricity shortest path problem. And here we define it as a decision problem. So we are given a graph G and a desired eccentricity K, which is a natural number. And the question is, does there exist a shortest path in the graph G between any two vertices uh, such that its eccentricity is at most k? Now, 
uh, we already saw one possible application at the beginning of the talk, and one can think of other similar applications in communication networks, transportation planning, etc. Uh, a bit more surprisingly, uh, there are also very different applications. Uh, for example, uh, the minimum eccentricity shortest path can be used to obtain uh, embeddings of a graph into the line. And there are also some applications in biology uh, where, for example, uh, people have created graphs um, where the vertices represent some DNA samples and they are connected by edges whenever the samples are similar. And people have been interested in some concepts uh, like k laminarity, which are very closely ties to the minimum eccentricity shortest path. Now we know about the problem um, that it's NP complete, and that naturally raises the question of whether there are some good parameterized algorithms for it. So what exactly is a parameterized algorithm. Uh, we say an algorithm with input x is fixed parameter tractable with respect to a parameter p. If we can write its time complexity as some function of the parameter p times a polynomial of the input size x. In particular, this means that if we would consider the parameter p to be a constant, then the whole algorithm would run in polynomial time. So some known results about the problem. As I mentioned before, the problem is NP complete, and there's an exact algorithm for it, which runs in time n to the power of 2k plus 2 times m. There's also a two approximation, uh, which runs in time uh, n cubed, and there's a three approximation, which runs in linear time. Uh, probably the most interesting result for us is that the problem is W2 hard with respect to the minimum eccentricity k. And this implies that we do not think that there's an algorithm uh, that would solve the problem in time, which is some function of uh, the eccentricity k times a polynomial of the size of the graph. Since we do not expect there to be an algorithm parameterized by the eccentricity itself, we were interested in algorithms parameterized by other structural parameters of the graph. Here on top, we see a diagram, uh, which is an overview of the parameters that we were interested in. Uh, whenever uh, two parameters are connected by an edge in this diagram, it means that if there is an FPT algorithm for the parameter below, this implies that there's also an FPT algorithm for the parameter above. In our paper, we present FPT algorithms parameterized by the maximum leaf number, modular width, uh, and distance to cluster, uh, which also implies FPT algorithms parameterized by the neighborhood diversity to uncover its vertex cover. And besides that, we present an FPT algorithm parameterized by the distance to disjoint paths combined with uh, the desired eccentricity. The first two algorithms, uh, so maximum each number and modular width, are fairly simple. The second two are more interesting. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to uh, explain uh, the distance to cluster algorithm. The ideas in this algorithm are very similar to those in the distance to disjoint paths plus minimum eccentricity algorithm. Let's start by defining what the distance to cluster parameter actually is. So suppose that we are given a graph and we suspect that it's almost a union of clicks, so a union of clusters, uh, up to some error. And we would like to somehow quantify that error. So one way that we could do that is to ask how many vertices we would need to remove from the graph in order for the rest of the graph to be a union of clicks. So, in the example that we see here, if we removed all the blue vertices, then the remainder would be a union of clicks. And if we have such a set whose removal uh, will result in a union of clicks, then we call this set a modulator to cluster. And then we say that the distance to cluster is the minimum size of a modulator to cluster. So in the case here, the size of this blue modulator to cluster is 4. 
and that also is the distance to cluster. And so we are interested in an FPP algorithm for the minimum eccentricity shortest path problem parametrized by this distance to cluster. And it will actually get the module H2 cluster as an input besides the actual underlying graph. So before diving into the FPP algorithm itself, let me define a seemingly unrelated problem, which will turn out to be very useful in the end. So it's called the constraint set cover problem, and it goes like this. We get for an input a set of requirements, and we get a family of disjoint sets of candidates, and we get a function which determines for each candidate which requirements it satisfies. And the goal is to choose exactly one candidate out of each set, such that together they satisfy all the requirements. So we could think of this as, uh, for example, we're attending a conference and uh, we have certain time slots. Uh, and in each time slot, we have a set of lectures, right? So, so each time slot is, is one of these sets, C1 to CM. And uh, we have some requirements, which are uh, topics that we would like to hear about at least once. And we want to choose exactly one lecture for each time slot, such that together um, we satisfy all the topics that we would like to hear about. So uh, for example, if we get this as, a, as an input for the set problem, so here uh, the rows represent the candidates. Uh, and we see that we have candidates one and two are in the first group, in the first family. Candidates three, four, and five are in the second family, and candidate six is in the third family. And then the columns represent the requirements. And for each candidate, we have a tick if the particular candidate uh, satisfies the particular requirement. Now, if we wanted to solve the constraint set cover problem, we could, for example, choose these candidates two for the first family, candidate three for the second family, and candidate six for the third family. And we see that together they satisfy all the requirements one, two, three, and four. Now, the constraint set cover problem in general can be solved in time uh, four to the R times R times C, where R is the number of requirements and C is the number of candidates. I'm not going to explain how exactly this is done, but it's basically a simple dynamic programming approach. So once we have this, we can finally go into our FPT algorithm. But Instead of an algorithm that is parametrized by the distance to cluster, uh, we will first see something a bit simpler. Namely, we will suppose that our input graph is actually a bipartite graph, and we will see an algorithm that is parametrized by the size of one of the bipartitions. So in this example graph here, I will always suppose that we're parametrizing on this last bipartition. So the running time of our algorithm uh, will end up being some, something exponential in the size of this left partition times the polynomial of the size of the whole graph. So how can we do this, right? We have this bipartite graph on the input, and we would like to find the shortest path in it, such that its eccentricity is at most some given number k. So what we can do first is suppose that such a path exists. We can call it p, and we can guess all the vertices in the left partition that lie on this path p. And by guess, I just mean we try all the possible combinations and we run the rest of the algorithm for each of these combinations. And in the end, if this path P actually exists, uh, we will necessarily make the correct guess at some point and then the rest of the algorithm will work out. So once we have this guess, we can also guess the order in which these vertices appear on the path. And we can guess which vertices, again, from within this last partition, which vertices are at distance one from the path. Once we have all of this, we really know a lot about the path that we're looking for. Uh, we basically know half of the vertices, those that are on the left, and we only need to identify uh, the vertices on the right that are on the path. And we can do that by solving the constraint set cover problem. So uh, for each pair of consecutive vertices on the left that are on the path, so that's the right, uh, that's the red vertices, for, for each pair, we have multiple options, right? Uh, it could be uh, 
any vertex that, that connects this pair could be uh, potentially the one that lies on the path that we're looking for. So for example, here between pi one and pi two, it could be either this orange vertex which connects them or this orange vertex which also connects them. Between pi two and pi three, we only have uh, this green vertex. There's no other option. So in general, uh, we want to uh, we want to make these sets of vertices the candidates in the constraint set cover problem, and we will make the blue vertices that are at distance one to be the requirements, right? So we want to choose exactly one vertex between each pair of consecutive red vertices, such that uh, all the blue vertices are neighbors of something that we chose in at least one of the sets. It remains to check that uh, these candidate sets are disjoint as is required by the constraint set cover problem definition, which they indeed are, because otherwise we would have a vertex like this one here, right, which connects uh, multiple uh, pairs. So, so here by one and by two, and also by two by three. This would necessarily mean that the guess that we initially made was incorrect, because uh, this wouldn't be a shortest path anymore, right? Uh, we could go from by one here and then directly to by three without ever crossing by two. So supposing that uh, our guesses were correct, this case does not happen. And once we solve the constraint set cover, that gives us a set of vertices on the right, which together with these red vertices forms a shortest path. And we know that all the blue vertices are at distance one from the path. And then we can actually prove inductively that the eccentricity of this path that we found is at most the same as the eccentricity of this path P that we made the guesses for. Now, what is the time complexity of this algorithm? Well, for the constraint set cover problem, uh, we saw the complexity before, and if we just plug in the numbers, we get this four to the power of C times C times N. Uh, but in order to solve that, we first needed to make uh, guesses for the vertices on the left. So for each vertex on the left, we needed to decide whether it was on the path, uh, meaning it was red, or at distance one from the path, meaning it was blue, or at distance more than one from the path. So that's three options for every vertex on the left. If we have C vertices on the left, that gives us three to the power of C options, um, which if we multiply by this four to the power of C, that gives us this 12 to the power of C in the overall complexity. Then we had to guess the order uh, for which we will just guess the first and the last vertex on the path and then uh, run a breadth first search to get uh, the remaining order, the order of the remaining vertices. Uh, now, the, the guesses for the first and the last vertex actually need to be out of all of the vertices on the graph, not only the left partition, because the path could also start on the right. So that's n squared guesses, and then another n squared is for the breadth first search. So that gives the overall time complexity of 12 to the power of c times n to the power of 4. And that's the bipartite graph of Gordon. And now uh, we will make some observations, and we will see that this algorithm actually works even in some more general settings. In particular, uh, we can see that if we also allow edges in the left partition, meaning it's not a bipartite graph really anymore, uh, but the algorithm actually pretty much works uh, even, for, even for these kinds of graphs. So for example, if we add an edge here between pi two and pi three, the only thing that changes is that uh, we kind of have to remove uh, one of the sets of, of candidates, this green one, because the shortest path in this graph can never go through this vertex. If we have both pi two and pi three on the, on the path, it will just go from pi two directly to pi three. Other than that, the algorithm remains completely unchanged and it works also uh, in the setting where it's not actually a bipartite graph anymore, but instead uh, the left uh, partition uh, is actually the vertex cover of the graph. So we have exactly the same time complexity as before, uh, which is 12 to the power of C times N to the power of 4. Now there is another generalization that we can make. Uh, namely, uh, we can allow all of these vertices on the right to, instead of being just singleton vertices, 
to be cliques in which all vertices have the same neighborhoods. Uh, it's pretty easy to see that uh, the algorithm uh, that we used before will still work because since all these vertices have the same neighborhoods, it doesn't really matter which one we would, we would choose. And because they form cliques, uh, the shortest path will use, like any shortest path will use at most one of the vertices in each clique. So the same algorithm still works even now. And for and this parameter is called uh, twin cover. And we still have the complexity of 12 to the power C times n to the power of four. Finally, we are getting to the FPT algorithm parameterized by the distance to cluster that was advertised in the beginning. So let's just quickly recall what the distance to cluster is. It's the size of, of the smallest modulator to cluster, which is a set of vertices such that if we remove them from the graph, then what remains is a disjoint union of cliques. So we see that this twin cover parameter actually satisfies that, right? If we removed all the vertices on the left here, which form a twin cover, then what remains is a disjoint union of clicks. But in general, what changes here is that we don't require anymore that the vertices on the right have the same neighborhoods. So for example, for this graph, the vertices on the left also form a modulator to cluster, right? If we remove all of them here, then still what remains on the right is the disjoint union of clicks. And now the algorithm, uh, it remains basically the same as before, but there are some changes that we need to make for it to work in this setting as well. So let's see what the changes are. First of all, we see that in this example graph, uh, these three orange vertices here, and uh, they are not uh, the valid candidates anymore to connect pi one, pi two, right? Because because they're not connected to pi two or pi or pi pi one. So. Uh, the only valid candidate between pi 1 and pi 2 is this orange vertex here. However, if we removed this edge connecting pi 1 and the orange vertex, then suddenly this vertex would not be a valid candidate. And instead, a valid candidate would be this pair of vertices here, right? Because pi 1 and pi 2 are now at distance 3, they need to be connected by a pair of vertices, not just by one vertex. So in general, depending on the distance of the respective two consecutive red vertices, uh, the candidates might either be individual vertices or pairs of vertices. Another thing that we need to uh, check for is if the desired eccentricity is k equals one, then we have a special case that uh, the constraint set cover problem doesn't uh, solve for us. And we can see uh, the problem here so right now we have two possible candidates uh, to choose between to choose from between pi one and pi two. Right? It's e either this pair of vertices on the left or this pair of vertices on the right. But if the if if, if we want to find a path whose eccentricity is one, uh, then we have to choose this pair of vertices on the right in order to satisfy this 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 vertex here. Right? If we choose if we choose this pair instead, then this vertex here would be at distance two from the path. But the constraint set cover problem doesn't distinguish between these two options because uh, both of them satisfy the same requirements right there. Well, I should say they don't satisfy any requirements. There's no blue vertex uh, connecting to either of these candidates. So that's just a special case that uh, needs to be checked kind of manually. It's just a special if statement that needs to be added in the algorithm from the case when k equals one to choose this pair instead of this pair. Another thing that needs to be taken care of is the following case. If we removed this edge here and instead we added this edge here, then what we see is that uh, this blue vertex, well, it cannot be a distance one from the shortest path that we will get, that we, that we would ever get, right? Because uh, like the, that, that would have to mean that this vertex is on the path, but that vertex is never uh, able to be on the shortest path from pi one to pi two. But uh, this requirement might still be useful to have, and in order to actually allow to have this blue vertex as a requirement, 
what we need to do is we need to allow uh, requirements to be also vertices that are a distance two from the path. And for that, we of course also need to do more guesswork because we need to guess uh, which vertices are at distance two from the path. Now, the final and last uh, thing that we need to change is that for before we were only guessing uh, which vertex was the very first and the very last on the path. And now we also need to check, uh, we also need to guess for the second and second to last vertex on, on, the, the, on the resulting path. Uh, that is because uh, all of these might be on the right side, right? Uh, we can now have as, much, as many as two vertices on the right before, uh, before the shortest path has to kind of alternate back to the left. And so that's just, uh, just a bit more guesswork that we need to do. And that is all the changes that we need to make for this uh, algorithm to work. So what's the resulting time complexity? Uh, it's pretty similar as before. Uh, before, we had this factor of 12 to the power of c, which now changed to 16 to the power of c. That's because of this additional guess for the vertices that are at distance 2 from the path. And then we had a factor of n to the power of 4, which changes to n to the power of 6 because of this n squared additional guesses for the second and second to last vertices on the path. Let me just summarize once more the, the results. So in the paper, we present four different FPT algorithms parameterized by the maximum leaf number, modular with distance to cluster, which is the algorithm that we just saw, and distance to disjoint paths combined with the desired eccentricity. The last algorithm is actually very similar in the core ideas as the algorithm that we just saw. So we also make a lot of guesses and then we solve the constraint set cover problem there. Uh, the difference is that we make even more guesses than in the distance to cluster algorithm. So instead of guessing which vertices are on the path at distance one and distance two from the path and at, at distance more than two from the path, here we guess uh, the distances up to uh, distance k, uh, which gives us this k to the power of c factor and also makes the whole algorithm parameterized not only by the distance to the chain paths, but also by the resulting eccentricity. Some open problems that we would like to see solved in the future are uh, an FPT algorithm that is parameterized by just the distance to disjoint paths alone without uh, the eccentricity, and then FPT algorithms parameterized by the feedback vertex set and by tree depth. Thank you for your attention.